You know, we live in a world where, quite frankly, giving glory to God is, um, just doesn't happen enough. That's all there is to it. Um, yesterday, Bill Conley and I had a chance with about uh, 35 other people to go paint at the Gospel Rescue Mission. What a privilege to help make a, a beautiful setting for something that is becoming beautiful in people's hearts, the transitions that are happening. Couldn't just help but think, you know what? This is a great place with a great ministry, and we're just helping it look a little bit better on the outside, and we're encouraging all of these people that work there. It was great to simply give glory to God with the paintbrush. Well, we had rollers, okay? You know what? Giving glory to God. We have 15 people that are leaving today. Some are actually on their way already. They're, they're traveling to uh, Gleanings. And Gleanings is a place where we make dry soup mixes to go all over the world. Our goal is to make at least 2.5 million servings of soup. That's a lot of people in case you didn't know that, okay? You know what? Hey, we're basically fellowshipping and doing stuff. And, and after a while you just go, hey, we just did 500,000 servings. The next day, hey, we did like 500,000 servings. And we're just having a great, and we're giving glory to God with our, with our hands. Just simply enjoying those opportunities. Um, I, I just thought I'd prep you for something now, even though this is almost, almost two months away. We had this really cool light show last year that just brought a lot of joy to some people's lives. You know what? Just the setting up of that, just the working at it, people coming to something like Trunk or Treat. You know, what I want you to know about our light show is this, is that this year, because of where we are, uh, every Friday and Saturday night, it's going to be a walk-in experience. We have, family, we have some family activities that are going to be there. And, and, and we think there will be about five to 700 people every night. Um, it, it's absolutely fantastic. And somebody said to me this week, they said, hey, are we really not doing the light show as many times as we did last year? And I said, no, actually, we, we are going to knock down some of the days because we're putting a little bit more emphasis on making contact with people. It was really, if you, anybody worked at the light show last year and you talked to somebody for about eight seconds and then they had to go, and, and, then, and then you're trying to tell them, could you get out of here fast because somebody needs to be in this parking spot like in about eight seconds, and, and hello, goodbye, hello, good, get out of here, come on. Uh, just, it was a little bit awkward, and we we're just trying to create a little bit more of an atmosphere. But I want you to know that we're simply giving glory to God for the opportunity to serve. Do you know you can give glory to God even when you're mopping the floor? Sweeping the floor? Lord, this morning, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you. Lord, we pray for the churches throughout Stockton that revival would break out in every one of them. And Lord, we would praise you and admonish the wonderful things that you have done, whether they're happening at uh, First Baptist Church, at Stockton Covenant Church, or um, one of the other churches in Stockton, because you are good, and we give glory to you in that way. Amen. Charles Spurgeon once said this, he says, you will never know the fullness of Christ until you know the emptiness of everything else. I want you to know that this Sunday and next Sunday, out of all 66 books of the Bible that we're on in this uh, Route 66 journey, these are the two hardest messages for me. And, and one of the reasons why is because, is because First Chronicles is actually sort of a review of some of the books that we've already been through. Okay? So in, in, in front of you, there's a little piece of paper. You mind grabbing that little piece of paper? And, and if you look at that piece of paper... Um, you, it, it, and turn it sideways so the blue is up at the top, okay? Um, so you, and, and as you look at that, you look along there and you realize you got, you got Genesis, Exodus, um, and, and, and then a couple of the books are down below. And the reason why they're down below is because they're so fast in the storyline that it's actually happening while something else is happening. And if you get over to where First and Second Chronicles are, you notice those aren't in the top row. You guys notice that? That's because it's a review, so, so basically it's all fin the story is finished, and then, and then, then they rewrote this, this and the re what they were rewriting for was this. 
Okay, I, I'm going to use a little map here, right? So, so we, have, we, have, we have Israel in the north and we have Judah in the south. And Assyria came and wiped out Judah and the, and the, and the, Christian, and the, and the believers all scattered. And then, a, then a, many years later, Babylonia took over Assyria, took over the Judah area and took over the Israel area. Okay, and, and as they took this over, they, they, they demolished everything. And, and this is when First, First Chronicles was written. It's written as, a, hey, you're starting over. Let me give you some tips. You're, hey, hey, when you return, you've been gone for 70 years. And some of you, all you have in, all you have in store is the place that you left was devastated. The temple was destroyed. The, uh, the things in the temple were wiped out. The walls of Jerusalem were destroyed. And everything was in shambles. And that's the picture that's in their mind. So let me ask you a question. What's most important if you have to start over? Is it a better house? Is it a nicer neighborhood? Is it a bigger job? Is it more money? Is it more vacations? Or is it simply the glory of God and giving him what is due, which is simply saying, dear God, I know the emptiness of life without you. And I want to give you glory and have you portray and change my life because of the glory of God. That's really why First Chronicles was written. Chronicles is reminding the people that our hearts being right with God is very important. First Chronicles 29, sort of the end of the book, and it says this. It says, David praised the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly, saying, Praise be to you, O Lord, our God, our Father of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. And then this is going to be on the, I think this is on the screen. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Man, that, that is incredible. I want you to know that, 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 that God is not a potluck. Okay? There's people who treat God. How many of you guys like potlucks? I like I, I really like potlucks, okay? And and I want you to know that that it's it's food galore. Sometimes like 50, 60 items to choose from. And when you and when I was little, you know, you always look for was there a Kentucky fried chicken bucket there? Anybody ever anybody remember those days? And it's like, please don't let the stingy people get in front of me as a stingy person because I want one of those pieces from the red and white bucket. Okay? And I want you to know that some dishes are huge at a potluck, okay? And 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 you know, we recognize the fried chicken, we recognize the devil day. Eggs. We recognize the watermelon and the jello. Gel but let's be honest, okay? There's a reason why they call it luck. <laughs> oh, you guys know what I'm talking about? You see that dish and it's green and it's like, it's something. I don't know what it is, but be lucky if we survive and eat that green dish. Or, or you see some blue food. There's no such thing as blue food. Um, um, you know, and you're thinking, hey, that's, that's, that looks like it might be cooked, okay? Um, um, I, I, and... and and I, I can say this in all honesty, okay? My mom, she loved potlucks. Nobody ever ate our food. And my mom used to say this, okay? My kids know this, right? This is so great. I don't even have to cook tomorrow. And I said, Mom, that's because your food's bad. <laughs> she had the biggest heart in the whole world. But seasonings were not her, like. But, but I want you to know that when you go to a potluck, there, there, there's three kinds of people who attend the potluck as far as the food goes. One is what we call the sampler. And they got their plate and they put about six things on and nothing touches anything else. Anybody like that? Like You're not taking a chance, okay? Then we got the piler. And the piler, it's all going in the same tube anyway, so just put it on and if it mixes and you have spaghetti on a little deviled egg with a little bit of hot sauce in there, you just, you just enjoy the whole thing. And then there's Mr. Choosy. I'm just hitting the four things that I like, nothing else. And I want you to know that many people treat God like potluck. They really do. And, and when I say that, it's like, like, I just want a little bit of God. I just want two ounces of God today. 
I don't want the whole thing. I just, I just want a little bit of God today. Make me feel better. Add a little bit of Jesus. And today I'm reminded of the fact that uh, no one is righteous, not even one. And in that regards, we need the glory of God more than we could ever imagine. Because God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. But many people just want enough of God to sample, to feel good for a little moment, get rid of that guilt feeling, okay? Uh, enough to satisfy grandma. Go to church enough just to satisfy grandma. Just enough to think that we're okay. But the mighty hand of God, the mighty hand of God is really what First Chronicles is all about. You know, the mighty hand of God is part of the story of Israel. Think about this. The mighty hand of God created the earth and, 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 and sent in motion something that simply said this. I can make something out of nothing. And it will be incredible. The mighty hand of God is seen in the judgment and the fall of man because God inspects what he expects. The mighty hand of God can be seen through a flood, but it can also be seen through the rainbow. The mighty hand of God can be seen in the escape from Egypt and in the judgment of the Egyptians. The mighty hand of God can be seen as, as, as David throws that little stone. Do you think he went like this? Tom, Tom, you think he went like this? Oh, praise God. I think the people are going, yeah, praise God. Let's Tebow on that one. Um, you know what I mean? Um, he, the mighty hand of God is seen as, as, as God consumes the sacrifice of the prophet Elijah. First Chronicles is simply, let, let, me read, let me read something to you. There's some notes up on the screen. This is something that I wrote about First Chronicles. First Chronicles might sound like a similar story to history because it is written in, because it was written with the same content as 2 Samuel and 1 and 2 Kings. And that's because it is similar. But each has a completely different purpose. 2 Samuel and 1 and 2 Kings are about the monarchies of the United Kingdom and focus on the lives of the three leaders and the need for those leaders to be fully devoted to God as they are both the spiritual and political leader of the country. Their story is a continual flow of the history of God's people. First Chronicles is written later after the 70 years of exile in Babylon and should probably be after the book of Nehemiah in its sequence. These returning Jews are given a simple set of highlights to consider and focus upon how an abundant, how an obedient life results in God's blessing and the priority of the temple and the leadership of God's people and the never-ending promises that have been given to the house of David. The authorship is told from a priestly perspective and focuses on worship of Almighty God and emphasizes the religious views of David, not any of David's achievements. A couple of incredible highlights are David's moving the Ark of the Covenant the way that it should be. The purchasing of the threshing floor and its sacrifice to God. David's incredible prayer in chapter 29, desiring the glory of God to be evident for gratitude of God's favor on David's family and having leadership in the nation and prayers for his children and descendants to devote themselves to God Almighty. It is truly a preparation for God's people as they return to Jerusalem. These people who are returning are really wanting hope. For a new leader is in a God, for, for a new time is in as they present themselves to the temple to gather and share it in the glory of God. They really need to point themselves to the glory of God. They're God's people and they have never been forgotten. So I guess a good question for all of us, how do we respond to life's disappointments? You may or may not know this. Uh, I had a really bad uh, uh, seizure the day after Christmas about eight years ago, nine years ago. It was, it was, all I know is I was talking to my cousin on the phone who's coming to visit from New York, and, and uh, all of a sudden I'm in an ambulance. And I just looked up at the guy and said, um, 
I said, are you taking me to go out to lunch with my cousin? I said, because she's coming to visit. He goes, what are you talking about? I said, well, I said, I said, I don't know where, I don't know why I'm in this vehicle. I said, but I was talking to my, talking to my cousin Jan on the phone. And she's coming from New York and we're supposed to go to Miguel's to have lunch. I said, are you taking me there? And he goes, you remember that? I said, yeah. I said, I said, and after, I said, my family, we're supposed to go over to uh, um, uh, sea cliff, sea, seascape. I said, somebody gave us a use of a cabin for a week. I said, I was talking to her about that. I was talking to my wife and kids about that. He goes, sir, you just had a seizure. <laughs> I said, well, what am I laying in the airport? He said, because you had a seizure. And he's, we're just, we're, we're just talking. You know, so we go to St. Jo- we go to Dameron, right? <laughs> I don't remember everything, but um, <laughs> we go to Dameron, and all of a sudden they said, hey, we're going to take you over to Foster City. Is that right? Red, Redwood City. Redwood City. And we're driving, uh, some in an ambulance driving. Over. You know the problem with being in the back of an ambulance is you don't even get to enjoy the ride. You don't even get the chance to watch, you know, but, but listening to the siren was cool and everything. And, and, I, and, I, and I said to the guy, I said, hey, are you going to go on the Nimitz? I said this to him earlier. Really. I said, are you going to go on the Nimitz or are you going to go on the MacArthur Freeway? And he goes, what are those? I go, well, I go, I go 880 goes this way and 580 goes this way. And I says, if my, if my wife's in back of us, I said, she needs to know if you're going on the 580 or the 880. And he goes, you're concerned about your wife right now? She's really concerned about it. I said, look. I said, my wife is directionally challenged a little bit, okay? And could you just call her? I, says, I said, hey, I said, here's, here's the phone number. Just give her a call. And, and I, I want you to know this guy is like amazed at all this. And then I said, hey, and, hey, and, and there was that game on TV this morning. I said, you know the score of the game? The guy goes, you're probably going to be okay. <laughs> now, what I want you to know is this, is that, is that it was a disappointing day. And, and, and the truth is, is that everything wasn't perfect after that. In fact, um, in, in fact, 21 days later, I had a seizure, grand mal seizure. And um, uh, no, no, I'm sorry, I, I, I messed up something, okay? Um, I had a, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, as, as I had this seizure, I'm thinking, this, th- th- life is messed up. We, 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 we went up to Hume Lake for a winter camp that we've been a part of for many years. And, and while we were there, I started to get some massive headaches. And it, it was probably due to the temperature change up there. Uh, but the point is, is that how do you respond to life's disappointments? In, in my case, in this particular instance, my, my, my life disappointment was I had, to, I, had to, I had to give a lot of things up. So, I, so I'm searching through this book trying to figure out you know, life's disappointment. It would be nice to walk away this morning with an understanding of how we can respond to life's disappointments. For these guys in the scriptures, they're returning to a city. They're returning to an area that is completely different than it was. How are they going to handle it? Here's the first thing. Never forget your real spiritual heritage. Never forget that you're a child of God. Never forget where you came from. Have any ever met somebody from Texas and they start talking to you? And they start saying things like, y'all, howdy, don't mess with Texas. Everything's bigger in Texas. I'm fixing to. Um, this ain't my first rodeo. And it, uh, sometimes you get wrapped up in that and you start to become them because you, they're, they're, how many guys know what I'm talking about? And you, you, no, that's not you. That's them. Okay, you don't live in Texas, okay? We got to remember our journey. First Chronicles, something's very clear about God, and there's this, there's these genealogies in the beginning of the book, and they're a reminder of the fact that we're from Adam, we are from God's creation. Okay, we're from we we we. Chronicles is reminding the people, hey, you are in the lineage of God, and you are God's people. Now the guy who. There's, there's, there's a couple of incredible passages, and, and, and let me read to you something that's from 1 Chronicles 16, because this, this gives us an understanding that, that David r- r- really believed in God, and his identity was in being a child of God. From 1 Chronicles 16, it says this, That day David committed to Asaph and his associates this psalm of thanks to the Lord. 
Okay, so this is a psalm that David wrote during this time. It says, give thanks to the Lord, call on his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to him, sing praise to him. Tell of all his wonderful acts. Glory in his name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord in his strength. Seek his face always. Remember the wonders he has done, his miracles and the judgments he pronounced. O descendants of Israel, his servant, O sons of Jacob, his chosen ones. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. He remembers his covenant forever. The word he commanded for a thousand generations. The covenant he made with Abraham. The oath he swore to Isaac. He confirmed it to Jacob as a decree to Israel as an everlasting covenant. To you I will give the land of Canaan as the portion you to inherit. He's giving glory to God. And, and, and what, what, what God is using is God has used this psalm of David to remind these people, give glory to God above everything else. Life stinks. But give glory to God because he's there. It goes on to say this in that psalm. It says, sing to the Lord all the earth. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations. His marvelous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be filled, feared above all gods. And all the gods of the nations are idols. Little g, capital G. Incredible thought. Remember where you're from. All my cousins lived in New York except our family. My dad had eight brothers and sisters. And we would go back there. Sometimes I would start using their little words and phrases. And they all would laugh. And they'd, they'd say, you don't talk like that. I said, well, I do here because I'm trying to fit in. And what God is what, 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 what being reminded of just like that Texas thing. You know, remember where you're from. You're from the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's a second thought. I want you to know this. Your value is from God. I brought something to help us understand this. Okay. John, what is this? $100 bill. It's a real one. Okay. Anybody like this 100 Bill, you want this $100 bill? What about now? That didn't change anything? Hey, you, you, you know what? Here's one of the reasons why we give glory to God. No matter what shape this is in, its worth is still $100. And the truth is, when we find our worth in Jesus Christ, when these people find their worth in God, the Jews who are returning, they have to remember this. You are God's people, and you are worth something to God. I have another one for the other service, okay? I just want you to know that, okay? Our value is from God. And so often we, 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 we cheapen God by, by trying to find value in other things. Here's a third thought, okay, is, it, is that we need to check our hearts, not just our actions. Anybody like the 1 Corinthians 13? 1 Corinthians 13 is a reminder of, hey, hey, don't just be a clanging symbol, but do it from love. Chapter 21, there's a story of David wanting to be obedient and worship to the Lord. There's a specific place where he is to build an altar. And he's to worship the Lord there. It is the threshing floor of a man named Aruana. And Aruana offers this threshing floor to David. And David says, no, I'll buy it. And Aruana says, no, you can have it. And he says, I will not sacrifice to the Lord my God something that is not mine. It's not a sacrifice to the Lord if I'm giving what you gave me. That's your sacrifice. 
And I think one of our thoughts is this. Are we generous with the Lord? Do we give out of our extra or do we give out of our primary? It's not the actions or the threshing floor that is most important. It's, 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 the, it's the heart there. It says this in chapter 21. Then David approached and where, and where Aruana looked and saw him, he left the threshing floor. He bowed down before David with his face to the ground. And David said to him, let me have the sight of the threshing floor so I can build an altar to the Lord. That the plague on the people may be stopped. Sell it to me at full price. Aruana said to David, take it. Let my Lord and my king do whatever King David wants. But King David replied to Arauna, no, I insist on paying full price. I will not take for the Lord what is yours or sacrifice a burnt offering that costs me nothing. So David paid Aruana 600 shekels of gold for the site. David built an altar to the Lord and sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. He called on the Lord, and the Lord answered him with fire from heaven on the offering, offering of this altar. Then the Lord spoke to the angel and put back his sword back into his sheath. At that time when David saw that the Lord had answered him on the threshing floor of Eru and Anna, the Jebusite, he offered sacrifices there. The tabernacle of the Lord which Moses had made in the desert and the altar of the burnt offering were at that time on the high place of Gibeon. But David could not go before it to inquire of the Lord because he was afraid of the sword of the angel. Here's a man who said this, I'm going to worship the Lord with my tangibility. But it's from the heart. It's from the heart. A lot of people exchange the glory of God for something so much less. Imagine being a five-year-old girl and your dad comes home from a trip and he gives you a set of pearls. They're just a little set of pearls. They're plastic. They're not the real thing. And you cherish those pearls because you've seen other people in pearls. And you just enjoy the beauty of these pearls. Then about a year later, your dad comes to you and says, hey, can I have those pearls back? And you think, Hey, you can have my old doll that's got one arm. You can have my toys that are broken. You can have my socks and you can have a dress. You can have my ribbons. <laughs> but not these pearls. And what the dad has in his hand is a set of real pearls. Genuine pearl. The real thing. And he just wants her to simply exchange this cheap imitation for the real thing. And what God is offering to these people as they return to Jerusalem, as we go through rough times, we have a chance to return to the real glory of God, not a cheap imitation. And simply put, this girl finally, finally she gives the pearls and her dad says, these are fake. I want to give you the real thing. Let's not be people who exchange the real glory of God for anything else. Because God's glory is so important. As we live life, let's not please God to pacify him. Let's please God because he's worthy. Let's please God with everything that we have. Let's simply enjoy the idea of whatever it is I do, in word or deed, do all to the glory of God because he deserves that. And when life stinks, when you've gone through disappointment, remember you're a child of God, remember your value has never changed, and remember that his glory is forever. Let's pray together. Father God, these people who are in captivity. They're returning to a place that is devastated. That their worship needed to be in you. 
their trust needed to be in you. Their value needed to be in the sense that they saw themselves as children of yours. Their value needed to be to run and walk away and to repent from the selfishness that they'd been exposed to. Lord, may we not ever exchange the glory of God for something less. May we enjoy, may we appreciate, and may we find great comfort in being a child of yours amidst all of the struggles of life that are going on. May we worship you in spirit and in truth, and may we worship you with our hands, with our eyes, with our attitudes, with our reactions, through our deeds. Because as was said at the beginning of the message, Lord, we will never know the fullness of Christ until we know the emptiness of everything else. We love you so much.